Good morning, City Club members and friends. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on today. We, um, Before I move any further, because I always forget this when we have a virtual presentation, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ed Mazur, our board chair, our board members, and all of our audience and friends. Thank you so much for participating and joining us. Um, our guest today is Mr. John Palfrey. He's the president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Palfrey is a well-respected educator, author, legal scholar, and innovator with expertise in how new media is changing learning and education. Prior to joining the foundation, he served as head of school at Phillips Academy, Andover, the only school of its kind to maintain need admissions. Prior to Phillips Academy, he served as the Henry N. S. III Professor of Law and Vice Dean for Library and Information Resources at Harvard Law as Executive Director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society from 2002 to 2008 and the founding board chair of the Digital Public Library America. He holds a JD from Harvard Law School, an MPhil from the University of Cambridge, and an AB from Harvard College. He is an accomplished author. His most recent book is Safe Spaces, Brave Spaces, Diversity and Free Expression in Education. John also serves on the board of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I am so excited to hear today's discussion. We will turn it to John and then we'll come back. I'm sure we've got questions already, but if you need to send questions then you can still do so. Mr. Palfrey, welcome to the City Club. Thank you, Jackie, so much for your kind introduction. And let me just please acknowledge your leadership at the City Club uh, at Northern Trust and in the community. Thank you for all that you do and how you inspire us. Thanks to the City Club of Chicago for inviting me to speak at this virtual luncheon. I wish, of course, we were all together in person having a nice pasta at Maggiano's, uh, but that will come in due course, I hope. Um, I do understand we have a fabulous uh, turnout and so grateful to each one of you for making time today to, uh, to join us for this discussion. And um, just for context, I will talk probably for 20, 25 minutes or so, so you can sit back and then um, we really look forward to engaging in your questions uh, and your thoughts. We are all a product of our family histories one way or another. As a new president of the MacArthur Foundation, I start by being acutely aware of the way in which our institution has grown out of a single family's generosity. Also the work that many people have done as MacArthur staff and board members, as well as grantees and partners for more than 40 years. And I understand uh, Adele Simmons and Julie Stash, who uh, preceded me as presidents, may be joining us today, as well as our board members, uh, and our relationship to the city we call home, the city of Chicago. There is so much to be proud of in the history of MacArthur Foundation and in the history of the city. MacArthur has known the world over, of course, for its fellows program, now in its fifth decade of honoring creative and effective individuals. Just imagine what it must be like to get one of those surprise phone calls in the fall from a phone with the 312 area code, offering a no strings attached five-year grant for which you didn't apply and didn't even know you were a candidate to keep doing the great things you were doing. And grant making in the areas of peace, of justice, of the environment and climate, journalism and media, Many other areas have supported creative and effective institutions around the world with grants in the billions of dollars since 1978. Of course, the world is a vastly different place today though than when the MacArthur family set up its foundation in the 1970s. And just as we need to be aware of our family and institutional histories and to honor the past, we need to recognize the ways that the context has changed, address where we haven't gotten things entirely right the first time around and imagine together a better future. For one thing, billions more people coexist on the planet today. For many of us, lifespans have dramatically increased. The internet has completely transformed communications and touched virtually every aspect of our lives. Information and disinformation is more readily, information, uh, readily accessible than ever before in human history. Along the way, we've witnessed extraordinary progress. The grant-making MacArthur and others have done on balance have indeed led to a more just, peaceful, and verdant world. And yet, and yet in 2021, so much remains unchanged. So many massive problems remain to be solved. So much of the world continues to hurt like a dream deferred in Langston Hughes' famous poem. So many problems are entrenched and woven into the fabric of our shared experience. Homelessness, climate change, racism. 
It's no secret that these challenges disproportionately affect people who are already among the most marginalized. And that is the hard truth behind why these problems still exist. George Floyd, Adam Toledo, Makia Bryant, Dante Wright, Anthony Alvarez, Breonna Taylor, and so many others' lives have been cut short by our acceptance of the unacceptable racism in our entrenched systems. Their deaths remind us that it is past time to choose a better way forward. My topic today is our collective project in philanthropy at this moment in history. At MacArthur Foundation and across our sector, we confront this injustice with the fierce urgency of now. While we have reason to be proud of the work we have done and the work our grantees have done for sure, we cannot be satisfied with what we see around us in 2021. And we all have a role to play in creating a brighter, more equitable, more inclusive future here in Chicago and around the world. At MacArthur, our day-to-day -day work is centered on a concept we call the just imperative. The just imperative demands that we center racial and ethnic equity in all that we do. As we seek to remake our systems and our society, it keeps us focused on what we do and how we do it. It reminds us to center and to lift up the voices of individuals and communities we seek to engage with and to serve. Just as I'm acutely aware of the family and institutional history of the MacArthur Foundation, I come to this work aware of my own family story and how it shapes the role I play as MacArthur Foundation's sixth president. I come to this work with a sense of optimism that is fueled by my experiences going back to childhood. Each morning, my parents, both pediatricians, would travel from the relatively comfortable, predominantly white community where we lived to the hospitals and community health centers where they engaged and served. Every day, they responded to the needs of communities in Boston that have been and continue to be underserved. I mention them in part because they retired a few weeks ago after careers like the MacArthur Foundation's history that spanned more than 40 years. I admired their trip by the city bus down Massachusetts Avenue to the communities of Boston where they engaged and where they served. At the same time, I admired their clear sense of global interconnection and our shared humanity. In my mom's case, for instance, she started her career focused on neighborhood health in Boston. Today, even in retirement, and yes, that's in air quotes in the case of my mom, she's focused on global health with projects from Chile to China. For both of my parents, their careers have been rooted in understanding and addressing the context that create inequities both locally and globally. I'm proud of and grateful for my parents' example. At the dinner table in the evening, my parents taught me and my siblings to understand where we came from and the privilege we hold, to examine the inequities of the present and to put our shoulders to the wheel to bring about an equitable future. This experience as the child of two activist doctors informs the thinking I bring to my work every day as president of MacArthur Foundation. This upbringing also informs how I seek to live the just imperative, a framework that started before I joined the foundation for which I call out my predecessor as president, Julius Dash. It is a set of ideas and commitments that I hope lives on long after both of our tenures. I, as an individual, and we in philanthropy have so much to learn as we organize our collective resource to meet this moment and to fund a movement, a movement that makes real a dream that has so far been deferred. In the spring of 2020, none of us could have foreseen the extraordinary toll of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have all been transformed in ways told and untold, seen and unseen. Our collective trauma, loss, and grief seemed to know no end. We must acknowledge that fact while also recognizing our shared humanity. We must also acknowledge the disproportionate harm in historically marginalized communities in Chicago, across the United States and globally. The twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racism are very much intertwined. They've led to an outsized impact on the physical and economic health of Black, Latinx, and Native American people. In communities of color, rates of COVID-19 exposure, illness, hospitalization, and death have all been higher. As we work together to create a future where people of color can survive and thrive, we must commit to a reimagining of what is possible. We must prioritize their vision, needs, and dreams. Even before the pandemic, disparities in life expectancy in Chicago foreshadowed the unequal impact it would have. I remember being so struck by one statistic when I first arrived in Chicago in the summer of 2019. You're probably all familiar with this terrible fact, but for someone moving to the city anew, it was a way to visualize and understand what we needed to do. This fact was the gap in life expectancy based on where one lived. As this particular study showed, you may recall, the life expectancy in Streeterville, mostly white and wealthy neighborhood, was 90 years. Nine miles south in Englewood, where most residents are black, 
life expectancy was just 60 years. Last month, when Mayor Lightfoot declared racism a public health crisis, she cited an overall 9.2 year life expectancy gap between black and non-black Chicagoans. Meanwhile, across the country, we've seen a rise in xenophobia and violence against people of Asian descent, particularly women and the elderly. Here in Chicago in recent months, a young Latinx man and teenager have been killed in police shootings. While these are unprecedented times, the problems we are confronting are not new. Racism is a contagion that list existed long before COVID-19. And in this context, MacArthur's just imperative calls us to action. White people, myself included, have an essential role to play in dismantling the structures that uphold systemic racism. We must deconstruct the thinking and practices that brought us to this point of reckoning, and we must in its place construct new systems. This imperative applies both to individuals and to institutions. It is clear that we need new directions in philanthropy to help communities recover and thrive. If money is medicine, as Edgar Villanueva writes in his book, Decolonizing Wealth, how do we ensure that we use it to heal the people and communities we seek to serve? For decades, privilege has reinforced grant-making methods that do not center the leadership of black, brown, and indigenous people. To that end, today I'm excited to share how we hope to realize the promise of this moment, to work for this dream that can no longer be deferred. MacArthur has a long-standing commitment to Chicago, our hometown, where we invest in people, places, and partnerships to advance racial equity and build a more, more inclusive Chicago. Over 40 years, we have invested $1.4 billion in more than 1,600 organizations and individuals, more than we have in any other place in the world. The Just Imperative calls on us to examine how our work in Chicago upholds an unjust status quo. We have listened, learned, and adjusted, and we have worked to follow the lead of people most proximate to the communities we aim to serve. However, there are times when those of us with power and resources must do more, and 2020 was just such a time. So last summer, we launched an equitable recovery initiative. In the depth of the COVID-19 crisis, the last thing we wanted to do was to cut our grant making to organizations more in need than ever in communities across the United States and in Mexico, India, and Nigeria. At the same time, our endowment had fallen in value, so we didn't want to sell our holdings at a deep, and as we now know, temporary discount. So instead, we did something unprecedented for MacArthur and I believe for our sector. We decided, among other uh, foundations, to borrow money so that we could give more money away. Last summer, we issued social bonds to raise $125 million for grants and investments above our typical annual giving. We took advantage of historically low interest rates. Bankers will be struck by the fact that we got a 1.299% interest rate so we could give out more money in a time of great need. Put another way, we were able to leverage our balance sheet to support individuals and communities who in turn will generate high social returns on these funds and whose balance sheets wouldn't have allowed such a form of leverage. Given the urgency of the moment, we announced $40 million in grants for the initiative last year. These grants address voting and democracy, anti-Black racism, and the impact of COVID-19 on Native Americans. They also supported technology and justice and Black, Latinx, Asian, and Indigenous arts organizations. But then we needed to step back and decide how to spend the rest of the bond money with a bit more strategic thinking. In the fall of 2020, we created, along with others, a novel collaborative approach for allocating the remaining $82 million in bond proceeds. Building on our recent experience in participatory grant making in the arts and 40 years of grant making in our fellows program, we invited 12 people with a diversity of perspectives to advise us on how to apply an anti-racist lens to our equitable recovery grant making. The input of these external advisors was critical to help us focus and avoid spreading the funds too thinly, one of our guiding principles. In consultation with these external advisors, our board and our staff, we arrived at the overarching theme, advancing racial and ethnic justice. Under that theme fall four focus areas. First, providing infrastructure support for black led organizations and efforts related to reparations and racial healing. Second, acknowledging and honoring indigenous communities authority over themselves, their distinct needs and their right to determine how best to heal and build the post pandemic future they want. Third, increasing health access, equity and accountability to communities most affected by COVID-19, including special focus on the Latinx communities here in Chicago. And fourth, a cross-cutting equitable housing demonstration project. This idea seeks to address the challenge of sustainable housing for those returning to the community from jails and prisons. 
Throughout our equitable recovery grant making, our goal was to allocate more than half of these funds to organizations that are black, indigenous, and people of color led or serving. I'm proud to say we've far exceeded that benchmark with the vast majority of our funding going to black led, indigenous led, Latinx led, or Asian led and centered organizations. Since MacArthur is a global foundation and our equitable recovery grant making reflects that commitment. We made grants to assist with COVID response and recovery in India, where cases skyrocketed this spring. Our racial justice grants included a focus on Nigeria and other parts of the African continent, while our support for indigenous communities included locations across North America, India, and Nigeria. I appreciate, however, that here at the City Club of Chicago, you may be especially interested in how funds were deployed in Chicago. In the early days of the pandemic, MacArthur contributed to several shared funds that many of us put our money together toward. We supported the Chicago Community and Illinois COVID-19 response funds, both of which helped provide immediate relief to families and emergency response to organizations. An amazing, amazing effort with the United Way and the Trust, and uh, also done at the statewide level. We joined our peers in creating funds to shore up both arts and journalism organizations, which in many ways weave together the fabric of our city. As the pandemic persisted, we interrogated our actions, asking if there was more we could do to create the conditions for justice to thrive. How could we remove the barriers that create inequities in our city? Through the We Rise Together Fund at the Chicago Community Trust, we hope to be part of a large group of partners who catalyze economic growth, mitigate the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19, and address racial inequities in the Chicago land region. And to promote relationship building among the city's diverse populations, we supported the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Initiative. We also joined with IFF, Joyce Foundation, Ford Foundation, and several other local funders to launch Chicago's Cultural Treasures, which helps create, preserve, and disseminate art by and for people of color. More recently, under the theme of health access, equity, and accountability, we made grants to facilitate vaccine access and distribution. We supported efforts that address immediate needs and look to the future, ensuring that Chicago builds a strong and effective public health infrastructure led by the communities most impacted. Community-based organizations have taken extraordinary steps to aid our neighbors and populations hardest hit by COVID. We send them our thanks. They helped families and seniors navigate complex systems to make vaccination appointments and establish convenient neighborhood-based vaccine sites. Through these efforts, organizations in Austin, Auburn Gresham, Belmont Cragen, Little Village, South Shore, and other communities have lowered barriers to access. In addition, we supported mental health initiatives for young people of color in the metro region. This recognizes the unequal toll the pandemic has taken on those who've experienced loss and whose education has been disrupted for well over a year. In our local response, we paid close attention to the heavy load COVID-19 placed on members of our Latinx community, many of whom are essential workers whose job put them at high risk. Many suspect that the Latinx COVID case count is even higher than reported. And I share that view because some individuals fear tests or treatment because of immigration status or lack of health insurance. But state and national data show that more than 70% of Latinx individuals want to receive the vaccine. So we invested in an initiative called Illinois Unidos, which responds to these particular challenges. Originally volunteering its time and experience, Illinois Unidos created a portal where residents can find up-to-date information on COVID tests, vaccines, and other health services in English and in Spanish. Now it also offers information on assistance with housing, food, employment, and immigration issues. It uses traditional media, such as Telemundo, to spread its message, but it also is placing digital ads on social media and deploying some really creative approaches to outreach. Powered by more than 200 volunteers, Illinois Unidos addresses the pandemic's impact on the Latin X community and in ways that can be widely understood and addressed equitably. We've also applied a racial and ethnic equity lens in all our work throughout the pandemic. Every effort was made to identify, listen to, and support organizations led by, serving, and centered on Asian, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. And with the just imperative as our North Star, we're working to apply this lens to all our work. This lens was especially focused in our racial justice field support area, which funds Black-led efforts and organizations. We're also taking a leadership role to position reparations and racial healing as issues philanthropy meaningful, meaningfully can help to address. The massive demonstrations for Black lives during the spring and summer of 2020 recentered the issue of racial injustice in the public realm and renewed debate on how to address more than 400 years of violence and oppression against Black people in the United States. 
Our racial justice field support work strengthens Black-led power building and organizing in the United States and sister movements in Nigeria. We support organizations that recognize that in order to fix structural and systemic racism, we must collectively disrupt existing structures of power that have upheld it. Last fall, as one example, we made an initial award to the Chicago Racial Justice Pooled Fund at Crossroads, which was co-designed by organizers, activists, and community leaders. The fund supports Black-led nonprofits working to address anti-Blackness through grassroots community organizing. In June of this year, we made a second grant to the fund, bringing our total contribution to $2 million to build and sustain these movements for justice that center Black lives. MacArthur's investments in Black-led and Black-focused racial justice organizations also helped to address our own history of underinvestment in this area. It was a pattern we found when we examined our work with the Just Imperative Lens, a pattern that mirrors philanthropy and the nonprofit sector more broadly. Black-led organizations have played a role in every major social movement in the U.S., but they face abysmally low funding relative to white-led organizations. A resource shift is beginning, but we must accelerate and sustain it over a long term. At MacArthur, we're guided by our belief in reparative justice, or the belief that major civic, philanthropic, and business institutions have an obligation to provide reparations to the communities that have suffered the most from the forces of white supremacy, systemic racism, and European colonialism in Asia and Africa. Our belief in reparations is founded on the simple premise that we cannot solve our most pressing problems unless the individuals and institutions that have benefited the most from the subjugation of black, brown, and indigenous communities do their part to promote healing today. This means working to rebuild or restore the health, economic prosperity, and communal land rights that were stolen from communities in the United States and around the world as a result of slavery, colonization, and the systems of oppression that followed in their wake. Reparations is one way to create the conditions for justice to thrive in the United States. The legacy of slavery and anti-Black oppression has made reparations necessary. We follow the lead of activists, including MacArthur fellow ta Coates, who have for many years advocated for it. To amplify calls for reparations, we supported a project associated with the Northeastern Illinois University Foundation called Grassroots Reparations Campaign. This campaign shares the stories and experiences of Black people in the United States to address the legacies of racism. It followed the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown and the community response to the lack of police accountability. The campaign is working to advance a culture of reparations that emerges from spiritual practice, transformative education, and action. And we support the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, also known as NCOBRA, one of the premier grassroots organizations formed to achieve reparations for people of African descent in America. NCOBRA has spearheaded, led, or co-led, or supported every major reparations action to date in the United States. It also supports several local and state level reparations efforts, including here in Chicago and in Evanston. Many of the organizations we fund are also considering how to reimagine public safety and policing. This emphasis is a critical one for us to address in Chicago, given its disproportionate impact on Black and Latinx communities. Through the Partnership for Safe and Peaceful Communities, or PSPC, MacArthur and 50 other funders, many of you here today included, with my thanks, have invested more than $90 million over five years toward reducing gun violence, building trust between residents and police officers, and reforming the Chicago Police Department. PSPC is now joining the conversation on reimagining public safety and policing, a conversation in which each and every one of us, in my view, must engage. If any re resident of Chicago feels unsafe or experiences harm at the hands of police, we must hear their calls for justice. It is a problem we must solve together. Recently, the Harris Poll and MacArthur surveyed Chicagoans to better understand the city's biggest challenges, particularly regarding public safety. The response shows a city with fraught feelings toward police when they feel both, so, which is both supported and wanted to be reformed. One finding was that 58% of Chicago residents oppose the defund the police movement, and yet they believe police can improve interactions with people of color with better training, including de-escalation and race-focused training and more alternatives to police response. Residents who want to cut police spending would like to see the money used for mental health care programs, gun violence prevention, and homeless services and shelters. While the central tenets of the defund movement can be divisive, supporters and non-supporters share common ground on some of its goals, such as investing in and using non-policing alternatives. This gives city leaders a roadmap for workable solutions with broad-based support. 
The paradigm here in Chicago makes it abundantly clear that guns, racism, and law enforcement are interconnected challenges. Policymakers cannot make progress on any one of these issues if we don't address all of them together. One final idea, an invitation actually, before I come to a close. I realize that not everyone here today is a grant maker, and so joining us in making grants or impact investments is not something every institution can do. But when I looked at the wonderful list of RSVPs for today's event, I realized that most everyone here is a leader of some type of organization in Chicago. That means we all make decisions about who to hire and who to do business with across a wide range of industries. I hope that every person here today, if you agree with the idea that we need to close the yawning wealth gap, do something about the ill effects of segregation and address the disproportionate deaths from gun violence and disease in Chicago, and I hope everyone does, then we might also agree to team up when it comes to accomplishing business diversity. By using the term business diversity, I mean focusing on who we hire as law firms, search firms, investment firms, advertising firms, just about any partners to help us accomplish our missions. I credit this term and this push to John Rogers of Ariel Investments and others who have made such efforts a priority in their firms. As part of the just imperative, MacArthur has committed ourselves to improving the diversity of the businesses we work with and the diversity within those firms. We have all have a role to play in who we invite to bid for our work, how we manage the hiring process, and with whom we choose to work. I hope we might all commit today to bring about a more equitable, inclusive, and vibrant economy in Chicago in the years to come through a deep and enduring commitment to business diversity practices. As I close, I'd like to emphasize the importance of standing in solidarity with leaders of social movements, listening to the perspectives, dreams, and ideas of the individuals and communities most impacted is essential to our work. We've made this a hallmark of our equitable recovery initiative at MacArthur, leaning into the advice of our external advisors. We strive to follow this model across all of our programs as we seek to become an anti-racist organization. MacArthur is also a learning organization devoted to the work of evaluation and holding ourselves accountable for our progress as well as our failures. We will make mistakes, we will adjust, and we will aim to do better. Internally, our aspiration is for each member of MacArthur Foundation, nearly 200 staff members around the globe, to feel a sense of belonging and a profound recognition that the just imperative is a part of all of our work. We continue to become more diverse as a foundation as to the organizations and people we support. And this imperative calls on us to lead with justice. Now is the time to fundamentally transform our systems, structures, and practices to imagine and then use everything we can to reconstruct something better. The old way of philanthropy is broken, but there is good news for our sector. The changes we need to make to be better stewards of our vast resources are well within reach. Let us stand in solidarity to create a future where equity and justice can endure, where this dream will no longer be deferred. I am delighted to be living in Chicago with all of you. I'm grateful for the chance to share our just imperative with you today. I'm indebted to so many of you who are working shoulder to shoulder with us at MacArthur Foundation, and I hope many others will join us on this journey toward a more equitable and inclusive future for Chicago and the many communities in which we work. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to continue the conversation and do what I can to answer your questions as Jackie leads the way from here. Thank you so much, John. Uh, if you weren't inspired, then they probably need to pinch themselves. What a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Now, I will tell you, we've got a ton of questions. So this would, if we were live, this would normally be the time where I say, you might want to get some water or hand you some water because you got a little bit of more talking to do because they're going to be left. There you go. Um, while you're uh, taking a second uh, just to kind of refresh yourself, I'd like to thank the MacArthur Foundation um, for everything that you do, not just around Chicago, but globally. Um, but the City Club would like to especially say thank you for um, what you're doing today. It means so much to us and for helping us continue our programming. Uh, we, oh, and let me also, while I'm giving you another second, if you are interested in becoming a, a member of City Club, please um, plan to log on virtually and um, our great office um, staff, who is fabulous, will make sure that you get taken care of. We will be doing um, a number of hybrid live and uh, virtual events as we try to stay as safe as possible. So um, with the um, almost 400 people on today, I'm sure that there are some folks who may um, be new to us 
or may not be members. So um, if you want to hear more great discussions like what John has just offered us and what we're going to get into with questions, please make sure you get your membership up to date. So uh, that said, I'm going to dive right into questions. I, I have so many questions myself, uh, but I won't be selfish. Uh, I've got so many notes about rebuilding and reconstructing and everything, but I will uh, defer to the, the several questions that I have. So let's just get right into it, okay? Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge Ann Evans of Elevate Energy. I hope you're in on today, Leanne. What is your vision for supporting Chicago's climate goals and for also advancing racial equity? I know you touched on that a little bit, but if you could just elaborate particularly on the climate goal part. Absolutely, Jackie. And first of all, let me just say we are uh, delighted at MacArthur to be able to support the City Club. I'm personally delighted to be a member, and I hope all those who are joining for the first time will see the, the great value of, of the way in which you get together and spread important big ideas across the city with a civic focus. So, um, this is such a good question and, and really a, a crucial one for today. Um, I didn't get into the climate solutions program at MacArthur Deeply uh, today, but it is our largest commitment in dollar amounts each year as, as one of our big bets. Um, our grant making is between 50 and $60 million a year to address climate change, as well as a series of impact investments where we invest in uh, organizations that are seeking to uh, bring about a, a, a more climate friendly future. Um, and there's a huge equity component. So as we look at our strategy, it is at once a scientific one, which is to try to keep the uh, rise in temperatures below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And it's also a social and political one, which is to focus on equity within climate work. So this question is, is absolutely dead on. Let me give you an example in Chicago that's specific. I mean, you could look across the globe and see who's affected by climate change and see that, again, it is often marginalized communities. But within Chicago, here's what I'm focused on, which is think about the future that we're going to need to build in terms of clean infrastructure and clean transportation. So you may be focusing on this infrastructure bill that is hopefully making its way through the Congress. Um, and one element is how do we build an infrastructure for clean transportation? So um, as we have city buses become electric, as we have buses coming through um, the, the city from elsewhere becoming electric, trucks becoming electric, um, uh, cars, of course, as an example. But as you think about this infrastructure, where and how is that infrastructure going to land? And if we don't have an equity lens, what you could imagine is somebody living in the Gold Coast driving a Tesla will have an easy time charging their car. But if you lived in a community that is less invested in, um, and I'm imagining it may be across either the, the racial um, or other wealth gaps, um, you might not have the benefit of that charging infrastructure because it costs a lot of money to put in those chargers. So if you think about the trucks and the buses and the cars that might rumble through a particular community, you don't want to end up, we don't want to end up with one where we have all the electric cleaner burning uh, vehicles and systems in one part of the city and have the dirtier burning ones that are spewing diesel in others, right? You, you can just see the, the, the paying forward of this history of, uh, of lack of investment and, and inequity coming forward. So as we build out the infrastructure for electric vehicles, clean transportation and climate here in Chicago, we need to have a strong equity lens or it's just going to be make things worse. So there are many examples of this, but I think it's a wonderful question because it forces us to use that racial equity lens as well as uh, the, the, the kind of core scientific climate uh, approach that we're taking uh, to get this right. Um, that is so meaty, and I'm sure that some of our climate um, folks and our corporate social responsibility people would have lots more to say about that. Um, and probably want to talk with you more. I um, hope you guys have a way to get in touch with them because uh, you can't come up to and talk to them after the program. Um, ben, we'll stay on that same theme for a second. Uh, ben Wild, I hope I'm saying that right. What role do you see in the arts in playing a recovery for the pandemic um, and combating overall racism and other issues in Chicago? I love this question too. It's a it's a great, as you say, Jackie. It's related to the other, the previous one in terms of this intersectionality between the arts uh, and racism and, and inequalities. Um, for one thing, if you have not, I would urge you to take in one or all of the incredible, incredible uh, presentations and. Uh, um, shows that are on right now to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the MacArthur Fellows. It's around the city of Chicago. It's a unique 
approach, which is it is 29 artists and 19 venues across the city. Um, it's mostly on the south side, um, some on the west side as well. Um, and it is uh, MacArthur Fellows and they're incredibly um, inspiring art, but spread in lots of different environments. So Smart Museum, the Stony Island Arts Bank, um, the Dusal Ball and so forth, you know, have all got installations. And I think that this is a part of bringing us together as we emerge from this pandemic and doing so um, where we have a racial equity lens. Um, you know, a second thing I would point to is this Chicago uh, cultural treasures approach that we've taken. This is a partnership, as I mentioned, with Joyce Foundation, um, with the Ford Foundation, and is really led by IFF. Um, and what's distinctive here is we took the investment from MacArthur, which I believe is $5 million. We matched it with um, uh, our, our uh, fellow funders, um, such as Joyce and, and Ford and others. Um, and so that amount of money um, in the $15 million plus range was then awarded to um, uh, black and indigenous and people of color led organizations around Chicago doing the arts by a community group. So we at MacArthur didn't actually um, decide who would get the funds. That was a uh, grant making done by IFF and its partners. So I think this approach of participatory grant making where yes, MacArthur is um, helping to shape the, the uh, parameters of the program and is shaping the process, but is actually putting it in the hands of community members, um, I think can lead to that sense of connection as well as um, engagement and, uh, and, and, and effectively allowing that art to uh, inspire and help, help uh, close some of these uh, gaps that we're worried about. So I could go on and on with examples, but I think there are many and I think it's a, a really, really great question. Those are, are great examples, and we we have. I think we live in the greatest city, so there's so much to to to, to see and and to learn. Um, a, a dear friend of, of yours, and and I think many of us are in here. Michelle Morales from the Woods Foundation, from the Woods Fund Chicago, says she just wants to appreciate your leadership and your allyship. Uh, John has been a wonderful ally for leaders of color like herself. So Michelle, thank you so much for that. That is. Um, such, 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 so nice to hear from her. Um, there are some really good questions and I'm gonna kind of speed through a couple of them. Jessica Yeren, or maybe Jessica Wan, what advice would you give to young professionals who are looking to move into the field of philanthropy? Well, Jackie, thank you. Uh, first of all, Michelle Morales, uh, we love you and uh, thank you for your leadership of Woods Fund. We follow in your lead as always. Um, and to this question about those seeking to get into philanthropy, uh, you know, I think it is a, a wonderful uh, career. It is, you know, I come out of um, being on the other side of the table as a grant seeker uh, for for decades, but mostly in education. Um, and I do think that that uh, one thing that philanthropy benefits from is having people who have done other interesting things coming to the the philanthropic side of the table. Um, I think there's value in having worked in uh, other sectors, whether nonprofit or for profit, and bringing those skills uh, forward to philanthropy. Uh, one of the reasons uh, for engaging in this way, I, I think, is that it allows you to do really catalytic change where you can invest a certain amount of money at a key moment. It's nowhere near as much as the money the business has or that the government has, but you can make change very quickly um, and you can catalyze uh, certain things happening. So if that kind of change and that kind of engagement is appealing to you, I would really encourage it um, you know, certainly one way to uh, make that shift um, is to volunteer your time to become a board member on some of the uh, or work for, for some of the grantees that we have. Those are often ways um, to get to know the people in uh, in grant making. And um, we have internship programs in MacArthur. There are lots of ways in which you can um, get into uh, the sector, but I, but I deeply encourage it, especially if you have a kind of public spirited uh, mission uh, in your heart. Volunteering is always um, the best way to uh, get an introduction to things. Um, the corporation that I happen to work for, uh, a little bank over on the corner of LaSalle and Monroe, uh, we uh, are, are very um, pro volunteering from the minute you walk into the door. Um, it just gives you such a window into things that you would never have um, regular exposure to on a day-to-day -day job. So um, that's, that's very key. Daniel Basil says, what is the foundation doing to help achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals in Chicago and in the US? 
Well, so it's a great question. So the SDGs, of course, are a agreed upon set of um, you know approaches to make a, a, an economy and a world that is more sustainable. Um, I would say I've addressed a little bit the the work around climate, which of course is one one bit big angle. But I actually think virtually every program that we have would link up to an, one or more SDGs. And and while it's not exactly the framework that we put on our website, it's absolutely something that we. Uh, that we focus on. We do support um, the UN Foundation as well in its work around the SDGs directly um, so that we have some uh, some kind of international uh, focus there. I will take this opportunity to call out and, and acknowledge the exceptional work of our, our staff members in uh, in places like India and a land like Nigeria where um, the, the work that we are doing is a little bit different but it's deeply connected. Just sticking with India for a moment, um, the climate work that we do here is not going to be sufficient, right? Even if the United States States became a much cleaner uh, economy without China and uh, India, of course, um, you know, we're just not going to get there in, term, in, in time. And so having the expertise of colleagues on the ground there who can inform what we do in Chicago, inform what we do nationally, um, and likewise on the race work, um, some of this, this uh, very interesting work around reparations is informed deeply by some of the work happening on the African continent, in particular in Nigeria, where we have our office. So um, I think that this, this question of seeing the connectivity, the global connectivity, and how we're all joined by these SDGs is uh, really a very, very important uh, concept. Great. Um, Martha Minow of Harvard University and I believe a MacArthur board member says, what are ways for global companies with a Chicago presence to become involved and to what become and, and to what to become involved in Chicago work of equity and renewal in this city? Well, Martha Minow, thank you for being a part of this and, and my life for a long time. Um, as you may know, she's a deep, a deep Chicago roots uh, and continues to be deeply involved in uh, in the city, even from Cambridge, Mass. Um, you know, I, I think that the way that we are going to make enormous progress is by aligning business interests, philanthropic nonprofit interests, and the government where possible. And there's no question that great institutions, and I would put Northern Trust high on that list, not just because Jackie's here and because they're our partner um, for some of our, our banking work, but because they really have led the way on diversity and, and volunteering and other aspects. You know, I think that that making commitments of the sort that many companies actually have done um, in the last uh, year or so, and then living up to them and actually being deeply accountable will be very important. So I would say this business diversity push that I made at the end of my remarks, where um, whether within firms or in terms of who you uh, are doing business with, I think is a big one. I would, you know, one of the things I fear most about what I've learned about Chicago is the hollowing out of the black middle class, as an example. And if that's happening in the city, and through hiring and through different practices, um, we can rebuild and support a black middle class. And we certainly wouldn't want that to happen with the Latinx community as it's continued to grow in Chicago, but we wouldn't want history to repeat itself in that respect. So I think corporations have a huge role to play there. I would say a second one, just to, to uh, take the opening Martha has provided here, um, would be if you're not involved in the Partnership for Safe and Peaceful Communities, I would take a, a sincere look at that. I think bringing down the rate of gun violence in the city will be crucial to accomplishing lots of other goals. And as I argued earlier, you know, I think these things are related. Um, the, of course, the history of race and redlining and segregation and so forth is tied to um, the practices of police, is tied to the way in which the city has operated, has you know, related to education and so forth. So there, you can't disentangle them. But I do think a focus on how we address gun violence here is going to require not just philanthropy and the relatively small number of corporations that are right now funding this work um, as we bridge to what I hope will be a city uh, state, county, you know, federal response. So I think that's a very warm invitation. I know the co-chairs Jen Keeling and Tawa Mitchell of the PSPC would love to hear from any major corporations or, or small corporations here in Chicago and, and have your help. So PSPC would be a second idea. Great. Um, I'm sure Tawa appreciates that. So I'm going to speed us up a little bit because this is like um, if you've ever seen a child with like a plate full of I'll say candy and cake, and they don't know which to choose first. That's how I feel about the remainder of these questions. There are so many of them. Um, Kenneth Hill of College, Chicago Pre-College Science and Engineering Programs says, does the MacArthur Foundation plan any new initiatives to increase the number of African-Americans and Latinos who can successfully complete a college STEM curriculum? So I appreciate this question, Kenneth. You know, 
um, one of the things that MacArthur is in the midst of doing, as many organizations are and do periodically, is to uh, think about the breadth of our programs. We do not have a program that specifically uh, addresses this uh, this set of needs. And I would say, um, while I completely agree with it and, and believe in, in the suggestion you made, it, it's not something we have um, extensive uh, commitments to right now. But we are always looking for um, the best way to uh, to devote our resources. And um, I would say that the greatest challenge that we face, the greatest challenge I face as a foundation president, but I think anybody working in a foundation is this question of discernment between these good things that we could do. So you present a great idea, um, and we have at least one board member who's watching today and and, we'll, uh, and many staff members of MacArthur. So we, we hear your suggestion, and um, as we go forward, we'll, we'll make sure it's in the mix. Um, but we certainly um, credit the idea and, and appreciate your, your, your suggestion. Kristen, I want to give a nod to you. I know you've been working hard behind the scenes, so thank you also while you're talking about your staff members. Um, Gabrielle Lyon, I think I'm saying the last name right. This is a, a meaty question. We've got a few of these. Given the foundation's recent experience rallying around COVID-19 relief efforts and moving funds beyond Chicago to the rest of the state, are you thinking differently at all to the foundation's role in Illinois or funding purview? or philanthropy's role in addressing disparities between available funding to small and rural communities and urban metro centers? This is such, such a good and hard question. Um, you know, I, I think it, um, you all know that the remit of MacArthur Foundation uh, is a global one, and we have worked on issues such as nuclear security and uh, global climate change um, that you know necessarily go across uh, uh, national borders. Um, that we have national programs such as the Fellows Program and our, our uh, effort to reform the criminal justice system, which is called the Safety and Justice Challenge, as an example. Um, uh, our journalism media program is national and has a little international scope. So um, we do have a very broad remit, and so that there's no question that rural as well as urban areas are uh, touched upon in this. So I'll, I'll grab our uh, journalism and media approach, which does give a few million dollars a year in Chicago around journalism and media, but we certainly look to other um, uh, rural environments where we know the needs can be just as great, if not more uh, more so. Um, certainly in the context of uh, funding indigenous uh, uh, peoples, very often there is an urban presence, but there also are, of course, uh, many environments that are not so um so we certainly cross that divide um, but I, but i think you raise a very good question choosing the geography uh, and the way in which we um we make funding available is very very hard even if you you know just look look locally in illinois if that's the core of the question we obviously find much more in the in chicago land region than we do um, elsewhere it's not to say we can't but um but uh, just in terms of our focus it, it has uh, rested on chicago again these are all you know very good suggestions and we certainly spend a lot of time thinking about this rural urban divide you describe um, i think it's unlikely that we're going to become say an illinois wide funder and spread the funds more equitably across the state than focusing on our home city of chicago i don't think that's realistic um, but i do think that this um, asking these hard questions about the way in which we think about rural, uh, rural uh, and urban um, needs i think that's uh, extremely important and i'm sure that our audience appreciates and i know i do i uh, appreciate the the tough uh, answers Sometimes they're hard to, to actually land on those answers, but you're answering them very well. Um, Chris Toft, I think you have a couple of questions in here, Chris, but I'm gonna go for this one because we're kind of sticking with that whole media theme here. Has the trust considered becoming involved in purchasing or rescuing any newspaper assets in the larger cities in order to preserve and enhance a robust free press? The acquisition of the Tribune by Alden seems to be a turning point towards profit rather than comprehensive news coverage. What is the danger of major urban newspapers weakening or disappearing? This is a good question. Uh, we could spend an entire hour and more on this incredibly important question. So I, I will speak personally for a minute and then I can talk about MacArthur. Uh, you know, I have very sincere concern about the future of our news media. Uh, my concern relates to the core of our democratic system. We need a strong uh, journalism and media sector, absolutely. It is why it's one of the enduring commitments of MacArthur Foundation to fund, um, particularly the nonprofit news sector, but, but to bolster the entire news sector. If you are looking for a book on this topic, I can tell you, look no further than Saving the News by Martha Minow, who is also on this call. Martha has a brand new book out in July, I think actually this month, 
Um, the core of the book, don't be fooled by the footnotes, it's 148 pages. It's actually not that long. If you really want a short part, read the four pages of the coda at the end, you will get the essence of it. Although I would urge you to read 148. Um, she makes the argument about some of the things that we need to do, particularly from a government regulation standpoint, but it, it addresses, I think, the core of this important question. Um, so absolutely is the answer to your question. We are looking at MacArthur in ways that we can partner with organizations um, to bolster the uh, the news and information ecosystem in Chicago and nationally, a little bit less so internationally. It is, it's got an important uh, function in our uh, Nigeria work as well. Um, uh, so um, my hunch for what you will see from us is continuing to find ways not to own and operate a newspaper because we are a charitable foundation, we don't not an operating company, um, but to respond to some of these drivers that you're describing and to support organizations that are seeking to come up with the models that will create the paper of record as well as all the other kind of news organizations that are needed to support our democracy. You know, and, and I think it does relate to this race uh, topic as well, which is we need to have a sector, a journalism media sector that looks more like the uh, the people who are being served. And, and um, one of the fields that I think has been least um, diverse in terms of staffing is the journalism field. The very, very low numbers, for instance, of black women employed as reporters throughout the journalism field, really embarrassingly low numbers. So these are kinds of things that we absolutely need to fun to have our democracy work the way that it needs to, and for people to be informed and engaged in the civic uh, experience, um, we really need a very different approach. Now, Chicago, I just want to shout out, has an unbelievable array of journalism and media outfits. It is not a news desert. Um, it is not a news desert, despite the challenges of the of the core newspapers. So, you know, whether that is the, the very small um, kinds of news outlets, both for profit and nonprofit that cover particular topics, which are our grantees, and I could list a bunch of them, but I don't want to because I don't want to leave some out. Um, but go to our, our list of grantees for the journalism and media program. Um, it's a really rich ecosystem. So part of it is also kind of a coordination mechanism and a platform so that we actually are getting the benefit of the amazing journalism and media, public and private um, that we have in, in a place like Chicago. Chicago. So anyway, so much more to be said. Thank you for raising it up. And it's absolutely a core concern of ours uh, today and going forward. You said it, not me, about that there could be a whole nother uh, uh, topic of conversation. I am already sure that um, that Amanda and Jan are looking to rebook you as soon as possible. I already, they haven't told me that, but I'm well, sure. Well, not are. me, but the City Club <laughs> should absolutely host <laughs> such a conversation. I think it's the great. City Club could absolutely do that. We could absolutely look into that. So Craig Pugh says, um, Craig, by the way, is from Public Communications Incorporated. The trend in the U.S. is that more money is being donated, but by fewer and fewer individuals of greater net worth. So what do you think could help reverse this trend to encourage more individuals to give to not-for-profits? Such a good question. You know, I, I've seen so many different cuts on these data. You know, I, I do think that that many of the people who donate, um, particularly to their churches and other nonprofits, are people who have much lower incomes than, than others. Um, and then, of course, as you, I think the data you're suggesting is that the very high net worth and ultra high net worth um, individuals giving a very large amounts of money, which will skew the data some. So I just want to be um, cognizant of and call out those with lower incomes, but who, as a percentage matter, are actually more generous than those of us with higher incomes. Uh, that's my understanding of the data in the United States. Um, but the, the the core of the question of how do we ensure greater levels of charitability um, and greater levels of engagement with nonprofits is such a good question. And, and I would call out um, both volunteering as well as uh, as making, making gifts. Um, I do think that that's something that would uh, help a lot. And I, I think that we can all see ourselves as philanthropists, even at a very small scale, even if it's a, a very modest amount of money, but to support consistently organizations. And you know, to my mind, the more we can give general operating support, we can do it with f a few strings attached as we possibly can to do it consistently. Um, you know, the challenge for a foundation is if you only do that, then you're never giving to any new organizations and you need to change them. But I think as individuals, for us to devote ourselves over a period of time to great organizations and really to give very generously and to do that consistently, I think that's a huge and very, very important way to engage civically. And, and we should encourage more of that. Um, I know there's some efforts uh, around uh, creating commissions to create more generosity. Um, as an example, I believe one that's based here in Chicago, uh, maybe getting off the ground, a, a generosity commission. So I think there are a number of ways to do that. From the perspective of organizations like MacArthur and, and foundations, 
I've uh, been the board chair of and, and am a board member of Knight Foundation. Knight and MacArthur joined up on something called News Match, and this will link this question to a previous question. But one thing we did was to put up money to match individual contributions to nonprofit journalism uh, outfits. And after 2016, when there was a big uh, a sort of assault on the media um, from some leading uh, uh, people in the public, th we put up the Newsmatch funds to try to ensure that people got kind of jumped in to support nonprofit media and, and to bolster it. That was actually a hugely successful program. So I think there's real opportunity for that. I, I look to the Chicago Community Trust with all of its donor advised funds. We have a lot of funds um, available there. You know, I think there are many ways in which we could think about uh, matches of various sorts that would encourage the kind of giving that you're talking about. And I could imagine a world in which we said, okay, let's really support um, a series of journalistic organizations in Chicago and let's have MacArthur and others put up some money and have other individuals um, join with that. We don't have such a program exactly today, but I could see doing something like that, um, particularly if individuals, business leaders, or just anybody um, you know, would, would wish to join us uh, in trying to, uh, to create the civic infrastructure, I think it'd be very positive. That speaks to uh, your comment about um, the collaborations being in the greatest city in the world. We've got MacArthur, we've got Joyce, we've got, uh, I don't want to start calling, but we've got Chicago Community Trust, like you said, I don't want to get in trouble, but there are so many and um, the, the conjunction and the way that everyone works together is just so beautiful. They're giving me the hook saying that I've only got a couple more questions to ask. So um, there are a plethora of questions that I think we'll probably have to get to you just so that you can see what they were. But this one's kind of a fun one from Soma Roy. How does your library and background help inform your approach to addressing gun violence issues um, third grade results determine where prisons are built. You know, the whole pipe, prison uh, pipeline. Jackie, I would love to see those other questions we're not getting to. And to your point about collaboration, I mean, I, I'm someone who was born in New York and raised in Boston. Chicago, you know, is unlike anywhere else, particularly on this collaboration front. And yes, we could all name a ton of different, you know, amazing foundations from family foundations through uh, through um, big legacy foundations. And really the the, the uh, coming together around these big issues is stunning and wonderful and unusual, um, and I and I um, I do call out the the uh, many in the in the uh, private sector uh, corporations and joining with foundations. So absolutely, that that's such an important um, uh, aspect of what's happening in Chicago, and it is held up as a model around the country. It's very unusual. Uh, and of course, I had nothing to do with it. it. It it completely predates me, so I can just cheer on others who have done it, but uh, but embrace it wholeheartedly. Um, in terms of this question, uh, background in, in being a library director, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more with the, the sentiment that um, libraries are institutions that can play a, an outsized role in uh, creating uh, kind of positive social outcomes. They, I, I always think of them as a cheap date. They don't, they don't cost that much money in a budget. Um, and yet they play such an essential role, whether that's access to information for a new immigrant to the city, um, whether it is a, a cool place to be, a safe place to be on a hot summer day, whether it's access to broadband internet um, for families that don't have it, where kids need it for school. Um, you know, I don't think we've cracked the code in terms of the, this, the, um, the very good question that, that you've just asked, the, the linkage between libraries and, uh, and gun safety, but it's something that certainly I'll bring, bring back to my conversations with Tawa and others uh, who are working on PSPC. Um, you know, I, one of the difficulties with a gun violence program is everything leads to everything, right? The, 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 where do you start? How do you kind of disentangle um, these issues? I think that's what we're that's what we're realizing, um, and that that we need to figure out uh, holistic ways. And I certainly, though we are not among them, I, I call out and and uh, laud those foundations that are doing early childhood education and doing work on literacy of kids up to third and fourth grade, where where we do know that's that's so crucial. Um, so all these things absolutely have to be coordinated and come together if we're going to have a successful outcome. So, so much work to do. I'm going to get, make this last question a mesh of two questions and see how crafty you are being able to answer it. Uh, non McDonald from Northwestern University says, what, initi what initiatives is your organization leading to? Uh, what types of equities, inequities are you focusing on health, education, wealth, food security? And then Mark Kirkenroy says, um, what is the tremendous undersupply with the tremendous undersupply of affordable housing, what is the foundation doing to address needs? So can we can you quickly sum up health, education, wealth, food securities, and housing in, in, in 30 seconds? I don't know if you can do that or not. I can't. 30 seconds is, uh, is, <laughs> is a wonderful, wonderful challenge. Um, you know, 
each of these issues are ones that are that are interconnected and necessary necessary to solve. Um, MacArthur has a very long history of uh, funding in the affordable housing areas. You probably know um, in the charitable and sorry in the equitable recovery grants we just made this um, housing. Uh, um, uh, initiative we mentioned with with Urban Institute would be one example. As we think about people who are coming back from jails and prisons, which we're encouraging by virtue of our safety and justice challenge, how do we address the housing needs that, uh, that they have? Um, that is connected, as you say, to food insecurity. It's connected to many other aspects of the inequities in our city. So um, the answer is we're trying to do what we can on a number of these fronts, seeing them as interconnected uh, and addressing them in a way that is holistic and where we're not actively funding in it to find partnerships and to support others and to make sure that what we're doing is listening to a broad range of community voices um, so that what we're doing is in fact reflective of what the community desires. Um, and that's the kind of accountability I think that we need going forward. And I hope I made that case uh, in my remarks earlier. So um, Jackie, thank you for so deftly managing these questions and, and for guiding the conversation today and for all you do for the city of Chicago. Thank you, John. I think that um, it, we'll make sure that our wonderful Jan gets you the remainder of these questions. There are probably 10 or 15 of them. So for our audience and members whose questions I did not get to, my sincere apologies, but I hope you had enough meat um, from, from John's presentation today to kind of pick off of that and um, we'll get the questions to him. For those um, of you who are new, um, this is normally where we do a wrap up in person, but we'll have to do it um, virtually today, John, you and MacArthur Foundation are some of our favorites. Thank you so much. The information is priceless. And uh, again, because we live in the greatest city in the world, um, we are afforded to be able to get to you easily. We know that that's uh, something that's not afforded to everyone. So we don't take that for granted. Um, for everyone else, thank you for participating today um, by way of listening virtually. We hope to everyone that everyone stays safe and that uh, we can be together again soon. This is hard not being together. We realize that uh, as humans, we are meant to be um, together. We're social creatures. So um, the next time that we feature you, we are hoping that we'll be somewhere um, looking face to face at one another. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we are about a minute or two over time but uh, we've gone over before. Uh, this conversation was well worth going over. So we will get the questions to you. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe and have a wonderful uh, rest of the week.